Wait, what? Yeah. Everyone but Heather Burgett, Commissioner, and she may be joining us via telephone. Okay. In that case, got the Pledge of Allegiance. There's the flag right here. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one God. Indivisible, justice, justice, justice for all. You gonna get that fixed? Yeah, I have an appointment with Steve's doctor on the twenty eighth. Be fine, on. I had it for the fourth, but Herbie was just getting out of the hospital. I'm gonna put you on uh, our microphone. So you are you all? Are you all signed in? Get started. Oh, okay. Do you want us to get started in the meantime? Okay, okay, I'm going to keep you on the line then, okay? Okay, hold on. Okay, Heather, can you tell us who's present? Yes, hello, it's Heather Burgess. Can you try that one more time, Heather? Hello, everyone, it's Heather Burgess. Okay. Perfect. Heather Burgess. You're perfect, thank you. Heather. Heather. You're perfect. Okay, we're just on uh, agenda item number one. What? You're on agenda item number one. Okay, now, item number one, approve the planning and zoning committees dated November 8th, 2021. Well, that was a while ago. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Mr. Chairman, on page two, uh, second full paragraph that begins, Mr. Bridge defined to the group. Third line down, the word zoning appears. Uh, what we did was not a zoning change, it was a land use change. And I suggest that we strike the word zoning and insert the word land, the words land use. Actually, should it be general plan? Um, well, it, it, earlier in the paragraph, it, they are referencing the general plan, or I was referencing the general plan, and this is just my explanation of that. So I, uh, the word zoning got in there, it should have said land use. I'll second the... Uh... Comment about land use. I think it's more appropriate to use the term. Okay. Yep. All, all those in favor? Uh, Aye. All right. Other? Mr. Chairman, I just make a clarification. I do not have did not have a conflict. I had a potential what? I did not have a conflict. I had a potential conflict. I don't think you need to uh, to what, do anything with the minutes, but just so you know. Okay. All right. That's why. Okay. Heather, did you hear the motion and the second? And I and I voted. Uh, okay. I I. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Any others? With that, I have a motion to approve. With so moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. All those nays? Approved. Well, item number two is, looks like, Steve, you got the floor. I get to bed before our bedtime tonight, too, keep in mind. <laughs> this is going to be a very, very fun filled long journey. A saga of no, I'm just you got five minutes, my friend. I appreciate it. You're gonna have to, stuff, you? You're gonna have to speak a little better. We haven't met in, since November. I think we should just take the time and <laughs> yeah, understand right. what we're here for. So the purpose of this is really to kind of talk about the Planning and Zoning Commission and the incorporation of the Economic Development Advisory Board as as component to um, the rules and responsibilities moving forward, and, and kind of the rationale is kind of how this this came came to fruition. Stacy, could you ask Samantha to let me into the Zoom room, please? Oh, Thank you. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So if, I can, it really kind of goes back to the idea of understanding what economic development and carefree is, why I am here. And, and, and so, and really the, when I was interviewed and I was hired, um, the primary reason was, was the idea that we were gonna have to look at the future funding for, for public services and that as, the town was nearing maturity, the cost of those services was going to still accelerate while our revenues were going to be slowing down. And this is really in conjunction also with the idea of being able to create recurring revenue um, for recurring costs, public safety, et cetera. But at the same time, it's one-time revenue. So when we have capital improvements, such as streets, buying fire equipment, whatever it is, anything that's a one-time capital, 
particular that was going to be going down too as well. But those recurring costs were we were going faster, we're accelerating past beyond where our recurring revenues were coming. So, um, so that's kind of where the 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 why they initially wanted to bring economic development in. And prior to that, everything was trying to do some marketing and trying to bring more people and you know, try, bring them in and look at town center. And then I think the reality was, it was just costing the town money. Um, we really, there was no ROI built into that. The other part of it is, is making sure that we have the appropriate mix of, of commercial uses within a town that supports a town, whether it's just personal services, whether it's retail services, restaurants, that we have that appropriate mix and that all those complementary mixes or uses fit together. And the other part of it is the revitalization of town center. And being that it's, it is our primary commercial area that we, are branded by, though I would say Lowe's probably generates more revenue than everything else combined. Um, it's, uh, it, it, is, it is an important, important part of the town and it's, there's been so much emphasis. It was here as part when the town was founded and everybody identifies and, and has feelings for this particular area and the local flavor that it provides. It's a very unique area. Um, I just kind of want to walk through, and when we understand services, so when we talk about funding, gap funding, I did some quick math, you know, and I know we're going through a fire program um, evaluation right now, and there's a public uh, committee that's been put together that's evaluating that, and I know they're going to be putting their re recommendation out to the public tomorrow, here, um, tomorrow evening, and, uh, and from there, there'll be a whole public process that goes through to evaluate what the next steps are for uh, for fire service. But when you just look at the math and kind of talking about this idea of gap funding, today the carefree resident gets about pays about or gets about nine hundred a thousand dollars in value for nothing, right? The, the the town instead of having a subscription service to you know uh, rural metro, which a lot of people had, the town went and made the investment, and you get about a nine hundred a thousand dollar value. Again, as we start to look at accelerating costs, when we start looking at what those costs for, for personnel are going to be, especially for fire personnel. And then we also look at automatic aid. You know, we got to figure out how we're going to deal with these cost increases if we're not looking at how we deal with our revenues as well. So if you look at the average assessed valuation and care for you about $700,000, your tax bill is about 3000 bucks a year. If we were in the Daisy Mountain Fire District, just by example, an automatic aid situation, your tax bill, or the tax bill, the total cost would be, would be you would be, you'd be paying twenty four hundred dollars for that fire service. That's what the cost would be for that particular service. So that'd be an eighty percent increase to what your current tax bill is today. Um, I also want to say that approximately every hundred thousand dollars, every million dollars of increased taxable revenue we can create create in town offsets about five hundred dollars per resident per for property taxes annually. So that's, and that's, this is just an estimate because it really depends on how much of a rate you have uh, applied for a property tax. So just, this is just kind of a rule of thumb that we've been using. And so when you look at the net difference between what you get today, that's offset by the 1% sales tax, that's about a $1,500 increase to property taxes that we'd be looking at. And that's, I think what, you know, when they, they go through their, their presentation tomorrow, it's going to be fairly similar to something like that. And so when we look at, when we've talked about from the day one and you look at the work plan, somewhere around a two and a half to three and a half million dollar shortfall, this is kind of the stuff that we're talking about. And these are the things that the town administration saw when they hired me was, hey, we've got these costs coming up. We're gonna be looking at going towards these types of, of, of public services. And on top of it, we're getting demands for a whole host of other things such as public safety, you know, crosswalks and, trails and dog parks and you name it we, we get requests for that kind of stuff and so what i'm talking about here just this math doesn't even include that stuff so we know as we move down the road that there's going to be additional things that we want to potentially fund um so this is why economic development at this juncture without a property tax in place is extremely important uh to a community like carefree so where does economic development fit in with planning well Economic development actually is a component to the carefree general plan, and it is part of the planning function. And as we evaluate things like fire protection and those types of services, those things will all be dictated about and, and the things that impact that will be based on the decisions of things that are in the general plan. So if we've made economic development a priority, then that's a component that as we look at as a planning effort, 
when we evaluate things like land use, that those considerations are also part of what's part of the, the general plan, as much as we want to provide services to the community as well. So it's a whole basket of things. And so it really makes sense um, as we come up to this general plan update that we really start thinking about this thing comprehensively because you know, there could be that we have to go to a vote potentially for a property tax, but we also have to go to a vote for the general plan. So this might be the right time. And I know that's what the town administration and Gary has, has been trying to get to a point where we can have these conversations and put those out into the public and we can start making some of the tough decisions that we're gonna have to probably make in the future about how we implement what we can with economic development versus what we're gonna be able to have to fund potentially through a property tax. Um, and so, you know, and I know as part of the role and responsibility for planning and zoning, I think a lot of the things you guys deal with are administrative type things, such as, you know, hillside ordinance and, and you know, reviewing home plats and whatever, you know, they, that it gets through. But a big part of it also, and we're going to be seeing that through the general plan update, is really the bigger vision piece of how a community is going to be tackling all these issues, open space, you know, revenue, um, public services, all these things are going to be addressed over you know, the coming you know, 24 months. I don't know how long that process is going to take as part of this general plan update. It's a very critical thing that this town is going to do. Um, and so you're the folks that are in a position to be really making a lot of recommendations for how we're going to move moving forward. As far as the Economic Development Advisory Board, this was actually a, a, a creation of mine. Um, I, when I was in with the city of Peoria and I was the Economic Development Director there, uh, we actually had what was called an economic development opportunity fund, and it was a $500,000 fund at the town that the economic development department had that allowed us to be able to go provide incentives for projects. And on top of it, we could also do other incentives. And so the role of that board was primarily to help oversee the, the public, how public funds were going to be invested into, into private projects and make sure that we had additional oversight before we went to council. You know, so it was really geared around the idea of how public finances were gonna be intertwined with economic development purpose. Uh, and as part of that as well, they were also engaged in helping along with some of the economic development planning. And I ran it very similar there with a 24 month business plan. And uh, um, and so uh, so that's kind of like the, the original thought. And, and the idea was, is while we don't have an economic development advisor or a, uh, an economic development opportunity fund here, we still look at potentially looking at incentives. And we also, as it really comes down to town center, because we didn't have a redevelopment area and we were going to look to be doing investment and maybe protect in, into private property or projects that would benefit private development, we wanted to have that extra layer of oversight when we started evaluating those types of projects. And so that was really how this was set up. So look at RFPs that we may be doing, looking at land transactions, looking at development agreements, those types of things. And that's really the role of an economic development advisory board is to look at those specific elements that were related to how public money is going to be facilitating private development. Any questions at this point? So why merge the EDAB with the PNZ? Um, well, again, as we go back to the, the, the majority of the things that we're looking at, we're going to be related to the town center. And one of the things that the decisions that have been made is, is to go through and create an actual redevelopment area boundary and enter into what's the redevelopment planning process. What do you mean by the uh, majority of things we'll be looking at is the, economic, the downtown redevelopment? Yeah. Are we not going to be, as an economic development advisory board, also involved with the other land uses, oh, the, the airport, the big state land pieces? Is that something you're not going to involve us in? We're only going to focus on downtown? No. Nope. We... Yeah, so, so Commissioner Corso. So what's one of the things that we're going to be focusing on that, but when I talk about land transactions, so as we start looking at ways that the town's going to be able to invest funds, a lot of that's going to be really around revitalization and redevelopment. And as you go into the redevelopment process, there's a whole set of different rules, and those rules are really going to be governed by... And I'm not talking about redevelopment, you know that. Huh? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Let me, let me, it's dot point number two here. So let me, yeah, so as we get through the, the, um, uh, the revital, you know, so we look at revitalization, those are the key elements when we start talking about public funding and private development. The other aspect of it is when we start looking at these other sites, the, the, the ability to provide incentives is, is almost, is practically zero. 
um, because in the cases, it may be like in the 45 acre state land piece, we have a little bit of opportunity, but at the commercial corners for Cave Creek and Carefree, Carefree and Tom Darlington, all the public infrastructure is outside of the scope of the town. So when you look at incentives, incentives have to have some type of public benefit. And if there's no public benefit to be gained, there's no incentive for a retail development that could be given. And, and so it really kind of precludes our ability to be able to do that. So when we start looking at those sites, it doesn't make sense. So the other site we have is the 45 acre site. When we start looking at potential for that type of, of, of um, investment, but there could be a whole, you know, and, and, and unlike the, the, the site we did for the resort site at Tom Darlington and, and Carefree Highway, that 45 acre site, there are so many ideas and thoughts that are really behind kind of where that last large track can go and, uh, and where it's going to be. And, and honestly, it doesn't sit really adjacent within 500 feet of too many residents. Um, so there's not a lot of direct neighborhood engagement like we had on the site that was over on Tom Darlington and Carefree Highway. Um, and, and it makes sense, particularly at this point, to maybe look at that as part of the general plan update process as we look at all these other services that we need to provide. Um, and I've even heard people talking about maybe that's where town hall should go or we should have a community center. And, you know, I think that's a good conversation to start having because it really is the last large piece that we've got left there. So, um, hey Steve, what actual chances do you think we have of getting the 45 acre state land parcel? What do you mean as far as buying it, purchasing it? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's any, that we have any desire to purchase the 45 acres. Um, we would have to buy it. There's no way that the state would ever give it to us. No, I said, what do you think our chances are of being able to buy it? Uh, it's not in, in any budget. So I'd say zero at this point. Uh, you know, there's ways that, that we could leverage, you know, public, um, you know, some kind of public services out there through <laughs> some type of, you know, agreement through rezoning or development agreement. I, you know, those are the things that we could get, start getting creative. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to get, a dog park or you know something included in, i don't know i'm you know kind of speaking out loud here right i don't know what i don't know i know that there's been application made to the state for that parcel mm -hmm. uh and so it will be going up for auction this year well, yeah. <clears throat> i don't know specifically who made that request I don't know either. you have an estimate as to what the value of the property is i don't have an estimate i can, well, I can look at if somebody goes in and makes an application the state land department they'll weigh it and decide whether or not they want to let that parcel loose into the marketplace when they do uh it'll be then it'll be the highest bidder yeah it goes to auction the baseline that's... with it and with commercial it's a little tricky because sometimes they'll do ground leases as opposed to uh fee title purchases so it gets a little weird with the with commercial land but that's not zone commercial no it's, it's zone zone r70 and so even if it was had commercial potential i've already talked to the state land department and you're true, you're right. The state land department for a very long time was only leasing out commercial viable property. Uh, but the, I think they're now into the business where they're selling it as well. So, oh, yeah, and so they, they personally told me that they're not, they're going to let that go to auction. They're going to sell it, but it's not at the highest of priorities to them. I mean, they have thousand acre tracks that home builders are, are putting to auction right now. So I can't even give you a date as to when I think that auction is going to happen. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk with the state land folks. They haven't even reached out to us. Um, regarding any application that was made, but we know one has been made, so. Uh, so Steve, have you uh, spoken to the, because I don't know if a lot of people realize that there's another complete development laid out with streets and everything else to the immediate east mm -hmm. of uh, the state lands, which is, you know, it's even got a couple of street signs and there's some gravel roads and nothing's ever happened to it since. So. That's Scottsdale, isn't it? No. No, no it's Carefree? Yeah. Oh, it's all here for you over to Pima Road. Oh. Chairman, uh, members of the commission, I think you're referring to Stage Creek Estates. That's platted. Stage Creek Estates. That's platted, but it hasn't been built. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I did. I did want to add, a uh, Chairman and um, Commissioner Davy. Um, the land department themselves do their own appraisals for the property. I don't know how or when that becomes public record, but they're the ones that have that knowledge of the value. But we don't have any monies in the budget for it. No, such a and there's been no consideration. When you said the name, I knew what you were talking about. But these are the types of things as we move forward. <clears throat> I think there are good, healthy conversations to have at a planning and zoning level. When we start looking at future land uses, you know, and it is kind of a frontier for, or a last frontier for us from being able to do these types of things to, to look at. And I know that that piece has been discussed, 
a lot over the history of the of the town on what could potentially happen there. Matter of fact, they, they originally they were even talking about that the botanical gardens could have gone on that site instead of here in town center. So there's been a lot of discussions on that. And, and I know this is crazy speak, but in 30 years, this town may be looking to potentially even put a school in. We have no idea how the demographic shift is going to take over a longer period of time. We've got no place for a school right now. And I'm, there's a lot more kids moving in here. So I, like I said, I don't know these things, but these are things we got to start addressing today. Knowing what you know about the state land department's process, why would you even spend any time when you'll have no input into that? An applicant will come in, an applicant will ask you if they can do what they want to do. Correct. You can't go influence that up front. So if I'm an applicant, I'm sitting there saying, I want to build residential on this. I'm going to bid it. I'm going to zone it. I'm going to plot it for residential. I'm going to put it up to bid. The applicant may not be the winning bidder. So the app, what yeah. you're saying is you're going out there and want to go to the land department saying, this is what we want to have happen to this parcel when it's immaterial. So we talked to the land department and the land department said, look, we don't have any specific use for this site. Huh? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, so with the way the process works at this point is, is if there wasn't an application, we could set the general plan however we want, right? So, but if there, if there is an application, then that applicant can come in and can build under the existing R70 zoning. There's nothing that we can do to stop that. Now, if that applicant wants to do anything different than the R70 zoning, then they have to come in and make application for rezoning. If they want to change the use, they would have to come in and do a general, a, a general plan amendment. So if they want to change the use fundamentally and they want to change the, the density, they're going to have to go through you and they're going to have to go through community process. Mm -hmm. So that is what we have. So, but again, somebody comes and does R70. That's the point where the town could not be the applicant. Because there's already an applicant on the table. That's Correct. Right. right. So the town could go in and, I guess, bid. No, no not bid. Right. Uh, bid is to buy. Right. Applicant is to plan. Uh, applicants to purchase. No. Not every time. No, no, no. Applicant can go in there and say, but it still has to go to bid. Applicant comes up in and says, I want to do the land use planning. I want us to I'll pay whatever the dollars are for to do that, but they're not but they're not committed to buy it. No, they're that's all. so this particular application would be for an auction. They would have to auction the site. Which the town could do. We could be the applicant to step into the planning process, take over the planning process, and then not bid on it when it's over, when it goes out. Correct. That's why I have as part of your responsibility moving forward was the general plan update and looking at that. Now we could go in and try to Okay. So we can go in and try to just do a general plan amendment to the site. And that's something that we can work together on. And we've worked with the state and the state would be open with that. Um, if that's the way we wanted to go. Um, I just, you know, that's where we're at right now. And so that's why I'm trying to get you guys up to speed on where the stuff's headed so we can get in front of it as, as much as we possibly can. You know, with the state land piece, I feel like we're, we're a little paddling a little bit from behind because there's an application out there. Um, but I would, very much like to get ahead of where we can go. But I, like I said, as far as economic development potential, I know that it exists on that site. I just don't know what that is. Can and the name of the applicant and request from the state land department report back to us? Sure, I can do that. Well, wait a minute, just getting the name of the applicant is, is important. Is what does the applicant want to do with that land? Well, right now, that's the key thing. Well, yeah, and they may not have said that, but the application process, we're, not, we're going to look to a planning effort. Okay, I'm sorry, Tom, go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I think the application is is public record, and I think we could, you know, request that information. I think what Steve is also referring to, though, however, is if we want to formulate the narrative of what that land use and what we want to see there, that would happen uh, in the general plan update based on just the size and nature and location. And this would allow then for a greater sort of public engagement. I mean, you went through with Steve, you had a very robust engagement just for the northwest corner. I think we see this parcel, and let me know if I'm not correct, that this is kind of more, like Steve said, we need to kind of have an outreach to the community to better understand what the best and highest use for oh, the town would be. But with that said, I mean, it originally was in the economic development plan yeah. to take it through a general plan process um, <laughs> in succession after of doing the other general plan amendment, because it was key to the, you know, like where I, we knew specifically what we were looking at for the, for the resort site. And that made a lot of sense. And we were able to engage the neighborhood and, and really work cooperatively with them on that. Um, but, you know, here it's a, uh, it's a little, it, it's a little more ambiguous, but if we want to go through that process, 
it's part of, you know, we had it as part of the plan and I, I don't have a problem taking it through. And this would actually be an appropriate time to get, get, get started on that because you know, the timing is it's a major general plan amendment and, but we would have to come up and, and identify the types of specific uses that we'd like to see there. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to do it. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I don't mind the hard work there and I don't, I don't know. Stacy, I have to put words in her mouth too, but I'm up for that challenge. Yeah, I think we're up for that challenge. But it's just, you know, at this point, and it really kind of came, you know, for me when we I listened to the discussion and I saw the comments and the input that I received from the PNZ when we went through the general plan amendment for the resort site. And I think it might be healthy to have a bigger and broader conversation with the PNZ on these particular on this, especially for this. And, in, and the rest of the future in this next 10 years, it's going to be, I think it's critical. And this is a good group. You know, you have a really good mix of, of experience base here. Um, so uh, I, I think it makes a heck of a lot of sense. And so the other part of it is, is, is that as part of the redevelopment law, and, and, and Commissioner Burns brought this up to me ahead of time, is, is that you can actually, as a town or a jurisdiction, can create what's called a, a slum and blight commission, right? It's a for better lack of term, a redevelopment commission. That is actually a commission that has specific rules outlined by law. So as we go through this process, the group, we can, you know, the PNC can, can evaluate and make the recommendation the council to either create that or not create that. So you are not, the, that, that commission is not you. That is a commission that would have to be created in lieu of council and council would have to agree to, to allow its powers to be taken over by this new board and entity. And the reason you do that is, is because in a lot of small towns and a lot of places, a lot of times you have council members who have conflicts of interest, they own land in the town. And that commission is specifically set up to completely eliminate that. So when you set those commissions up, you don't put people on who are property owners with, con with conflicts of interest. And so otherwise, because you require a super majority of votes on things, you, you can never get, you can never have a vote because half the council's Mm -hmm. has to recuse themselves so those are the reasons why they usually set those up in a town where you have two-year terms and you know and we talk about things like term limits and now obviously you got transitions you don't know who's going to be potentially going to be on council and it could be somebody that has conflict of interest i don't know so it's something to contemplate as we move forward um in, in this particular process and and look at making that type of recommendation for council to consider and, uh, and I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just saying, I just trying to clarify that. And so what happens is, is because you can create that committee, because P and Z has the statutory responsibility to now be evaluating and making a written recommendation to council for the redevelopment plan itself, it just it just was no made no sense to have a separate entity. You guys, council, it just was it just was a little unwieldy at that point. And a lot of it was triggered because we went and created the redevelopment area boundary. Now I'm going to say with that redevelopment area boundary, there's nothing in place. We can't do anything under that other than create the redevelopment plan. And so with me here is um, Matt Clasico. Matt Clasico. He's with Michael Baker International. They did the original Village Center Master Plan. Matt is going to be the consultant that we've hired um, to work specifically on the redevelopment plan. Now I also want to say that we're also in, uh, working with Kimley Horn. Kimley Horn has hired Michael Baker as a subcontractor. And Kimley Horn is working on the signage circulation and parking plan. And so when you go back to the town village center master plan, if you had a chance to look at that document, um, it really talks about a lot of these things that are that we needed to do, signage circulation, parking, address all that stuff. It also talked about revitalization. But the reality is, is many of the things that were in there we simply just can't, couldn't do without a redevelopment area and, and, the, and the tools that a redevelopment area allows you to have to do that. Um, so that's why we're walking through this process. So this group's gonna be also overseeing the Kimley Horn signage parking and circulation plan because it's a planning initiative. And it's gonna go kind of hand in hand with how we're looking at the uh, um, redevelopment plan itself. And if you look at the redevelopment plan, one big component to that is, is economics. And economics in there is making sure that when we evaluate all the infrastructure that needs to get done, the streets, the parking, the sidewalks that can support that. And then we start looking at the types of programs we wanna have in that are gonna help assist in revitalization. You have to outline what those costs are gonna be, or at least have a method in economics of how you're gonna pay for stuff, how you potentially could pay for things, what those costs potentially be, 
or the processes for evaluation when you start looking at projects. So let's say if we went through and decided to sell the town hall site and that town hall site, um, uh, and we, we were looking at, and we, we want it to be, we all agreed and say, you know, we'd love to have a, a, a restaurant there, mixed use, da, 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 however we want it, whatever we decide, we can actually take that now to RFP under the redevelopment law versus having to sell the highest bidder. Um, and especially on a site like that, if you top one, one and a half million dollars, now you have to go to a public vote. So we can, don't necessarily have to do that. We can accomplish the goal through a, a, an RFP process. And it's a competitive process that we all agree on of what we want to see there. And then we can evaluate the best proposal. And that proposal will have an economic component to it. You're not implying that without a redevelopment, you don't have to do those things. Right. You, Correct. Not, if you don't have a redevelopment, you can still sell property, put it up in bid. You can put development standards on it, put an RFP that says the only people want that are able to buy this from us are these kind of people with this kind of standard. So you don't need a redevelopment to sell land. Yeah. Commissioner Corso, no, that's not true. The law is pretty clear that it goes to the highest that better. That is how you can sell property in the state of Arizona. And you can try to monkey through it through zoning, but you can't get specifically what you want. You can't put conditions on a sale based on, on those conditions on the sale of a property. It truly just goes to public auction. That's how line gets sold. And so that's why they have redevelopment. That's why the redevelopment law exists. Part of the reason is, is to allow towns to be able to just, you know, deal with property in, in a manner more like the private sector potentially could. It still has to go through a public process. It still has to go through a competitive bid process. So, but that's just one of the components that we'll look at. And as you look at roles and responsibilities of an economic development advisory board, so those are the things an EDAB would look at. So as we go through the planning process and we get down the road, you know, or a Solomon Blight Commission would look at it um, is looking at uh, how we evaluate those types of projects. So if we're going to go to RFP, how would we evaluate those? Um, so all that's going to be spelled out in the redevelopment plan. And that's where I really, it's kind of this planning process. And then we get to this implementation phase. So, um, and right now it's critical that you guys are engaged in the planning process. Um, I want to also talk about the Economic Development Technical Advisory Panel. Um, this was actually created specifically as, as, as a resource group. And um, if you look at the makeup, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a local developer that revitalized the uh, um, uh, Spanish village. It's a local resident that does land use uh, planning and, and commercial design. Uh, it's another one that manages the Basho Center um, and another local resident that's actually uh, 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 the managing partner for a commercial brokerage firm that deals with retail. So it was really built around the idea of getting um, uh, a, a professional resource group that allowed us to be able to evaluate a lot of things we're working on in economic development. Um, again, it's just a lot of input. And, and, and so uh, kind of most likely a, a stakeholder group and or more aligned with that. Uh, the only time that we've ever worked with the ITAP in public was when we met as a, as a uh, in a workshop session with this particular commission when we talked about the redevelopment area. So that's a, and it still continue on as an economic, it's an ad hoc group. And so people kind of come and go um, when they have the availability. And then we start looking at what we need as far as resources, but I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the members, um, as part of this process, we have to do uh, an economic development market, or I'm mean, sorry, a market analysis. So when we evaluate the redevelopment <laughs> plan, this market analysis will look at the types of uses for commercial and whether or not you could support the redevelopment plan itself. But you need to also start with a baseline market analysis. So we're updating the 15 or the one that was done in 2015 or looking to update that particular analysis. To be honest with you, when we started talking about it, not much has changed. So it's going to be kind of a smaller delta analysis. And then we're going to ask that consultant to look more look, look, uh, more at the outcomes of what this plan would potentially produce and looking forward in the future about how this redevelopment plan will play into the future of the community over the next 10 years. So that's where, uh, uh, so when we were going through that process to be able to get the background data. Um, one of the members of the EdTap provided data through, a, uh, through CoStar, which is um, a software, uh, uh, application that that basically keeps tabs on all real estate, you know, something that the town just can't afford to have. 
and here we have the opportunity to have somebody to be able to provide that at no cost uh, for services. And so um, all of our demographic data was provided by an EdTap member that we have on our website. And, uh, and so that's uh, what EdTap does. And so um, we're gonna continue to use that as an extension for what we do as staff and we'll continue to, to, to engage with that at tech group and again if there's any opportunity for us to be able to utilize that resource to better educate uh the pnz moving forward on economic issues or re real estate issues or, or, or any of those issues you want that professional advice you know that's a resource that could be made available like it was when we did the workshop um the next steps so this is kind of where the rubber hits the road. Um, the PNZ, or I'm sorry, the, the Kimberly Hint Horn study is getting to a point where we're ready to bring it to uh, uh, prime time. And, you know, we've had a stakeholder group that's been evaluating it on one of the commissioners. Uh, Ms. Hitchens has been on that group. And uh, I said Ms. Um, has been on, on that uh, and she, as part of the PNZ. And... Um, We've gotten to a point now where we're going to have a conceptual idea of how we're looking at overall circulation and parking and they also have some signage concepts that we want to start sharing and that's going to look at not only internally to the how we move about in town outside of town center but that also is going to be looking at tom darlington and cave creek road and making any kind of recommendations for any kind of trail system um, we're looking at potentially taking it down to one lane each direction adding in on-street parking, uh, giving things a better front door, making safe, you know, instead of looking at all the stuff onesie twosie, it's a comprehensive look at how we can do public safety, safer crosswalks, slow traffic down, increase the parking, give better visibility to the commercial component, and then how signage would play into all of that, both wayfinding signage and just, you know, town branding type signage. So those are things that we're, we're we have another meeting with the stakeholder group that's coming up at the end of this month. And then we're looking in March to be able to start kicking off workshop sessions with PNZ group to roll that out. As part of that workshop session, we're going to look at the overall public engagement that you're going to want us to have and, um, you know, kind of how we want to roll that out. I, I personally like to kind of break it into those most impacted. So we look at all the areas that are surrounding that are going to be touching a lot of this infrastructure that we're talking about as well as having a larger conversation with the community you know, at large and the issues that they're gonna be facing. And so the stakeholder group does have a wide range of those folks. Um, and we've got all kinds of input, which is interesting um, about what is important to citizens as they start looking at that infrastructure and how they access town center and what it means to them. So, uh, you know, my goal is, is to have the bulk of this, both the redevelopment plan and the Kinley Horn study um, and we'll be doing workshops with for both of those. Um, by the end, you know, the bulk of that work done before summer, understanding that we'll have some time, we need some time over the summer to be able to distill things and then come back in the fall because we don't want to make any, we're not making big decisions over the summertime. Um, so that's, it's really about creating a larger public engagement. And I've actually added two new members uh, to the stakeholder group of who reached out that are in adjacent communities to the town center. So. So I'm sorry. Yes, uh, Commissioner Burns. No, the the stakeholder group was a, a was another ad hoc group that was put together specifically for the purpose to um, uh, eval help evaluate through the Kimley Horn planning process, and uh, and so it's just really just a a, a a local stakeholder group that's just providing feedback and, and information um, on that particular. Uh, Yeah, so so Ed Tap is PNZ, we got a stakeholder group. Who else do we have? That it? That's it. Now you don't understand why I didn't want to have another EDAP. <laughs> because it was gonna, you know, we do want to have our citizen groups and we want those citizen groups to be able to be they're they're very important, but it's also important, and I'm telling you, when you're a small staff, you have one in in, in, a, in a town that has a lot of you know, critical decisions that we have to make. It's nice having a resource group like the EdTap. And, and these people reached out to me and said, how can I help? You know, what, what can we do to help you move the needle? We believe in this town, just like you do. We believe in the things that you're, you're talking about. And so that's that's kind of how that, that, that came to fruition. It was people I was already talking to anyhow. 
So that's where we're at. And it's, it's going to be kind of a two, there's two things that are moving here. There's a redevelopment plan. And then you have in your packets, the, the laws that govern what needs to be part of a redevelopment plan. And Matt's going to be working on that specifically. Kimley Horn is going to be working more specifically on the, the infrastructure piece and the signage part. But they're working together, which is important um, because they need to have that cross communication. Because when we start evaluating the costs, a lot of those costs, that cost information is going to come from the Kimley Horn study when they start looking at the, at the infrastructure. And particularly when we start looking at the major arterials. And then, so they're going to be coming to, uh, we should actually have a 30%. I think uh, engineering document to build upon or to, to design, which should get us a really good estimate for what those um, improvements should cost. And so it's, I think it's important that we, we have that up front. So we're not just talking about pie in the sky stuff. And then we start putting together the pieces of, you know, how do you fund this stuff? And so maybe it's, uh, maybe it's $10 million and you can do that over a, a 10 year period. Maybe it's $30 million and you do it over a 30 year period, but we start, analyzing it, evaluating it, and looking where those funds are. The one nice thing about a redevelopment area is there's also ability to get federal grants. There's a community development block grants, as well as the ADA um, provides grants. And when you have a redevelopment area, well, you have to have a redevelopment area to get the CDBG funds. So, uh, but especially with the ADA funds, and when we start looking at the needs we have here, a lot of it are gonna be sidewalk access and bike, bike access. We, we do have issues that we probably need to do address where sidewalks literally end in nowhere. Um, crosswalks go into ditches, you know, so how do we, you know, find creative ways to be able to, to address those and fund those? Now, I would think the ADA would be very helpful because our demographics, the vast majority is 65 plus. Yep, that's the thought. I agree with you. I mean, I was, I was looking at a sheet that had our demographics the other day and it's like 65 plus is the vast majority. So I, I would think the ADA would be yep. very helpful with that. And so that's the thought, you know, and actually I was um, talking with uh, Max over at Ortega's. He's the owner there. And, and if you look, mm -hmm. when you go across the alleyway there, he's got a two-step that walks up. And one of the first, I, you know, those are the kinds of things you notice when you start saying, well, when you come off a sidewalk and one's ADA compliant, and then, but then you come into a, two giant steps, where do you go? You know, and so... Right just trying to figure out ways to be able to solve those kinds of issues. Well, I think um, the ADA could be very valuable to us. Yep. So with that, is there, you know, I know it's a lot, uh, but I, I really do believe that we're headed in the right direction. And I'm, I'm super excited to be able to start moving more into this public process of having things to show the public. And, um, and, and there will be a robust, you know, in my mind, outreach to both all the HOAs, uh, and HOA contacts. Um, we'll continue probably with the, the stakeholder group. And if we need to add on to that stakeholder group um, for the Kimley Horn study, we can do that as well. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's really, it's an exciting time. I mean, you guys are at the forefront of, think of the next, really the, the future for this community. Well, I think that uh, the exhibit A outlined pretty well what our future responsibilities are gonna be in, involved in this and did a pretty good job of that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Although you can maybe do one thing for this normal retired contractor. Uh, would you put further definition on the word? It's on the second page of the exhibit A at the very bottom. And the word is charrette. Charrette. What is what is the definition of that mean? <laughs> so chairman, a charrette is is basically a conceptual, you know, where a group of people come together and they create a design uh, for something. So it's kind of a visioning design process. And typically okay. you'll sit down. And you'll have somebody who can artistically represent what's being discussed. And when you're done, so let's say, and the idea would be like carefree drive, it'd be really nice to be able to have somebody who could sit down and, and, and cap, capture what those comments are and to be able to visually show okay, what I, that looks like. So, Stacy, actually, have you ever seen what she's drawn for uh, um, Cape Creek Road? I've never I've never seen it before. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. And yeah, Stacy, you gotta, yeah, I, you know, I used it. I, I mean, I just assume. You know, they assume everybody knows it. So, well, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so, there you go. Oh. <laughs> you know what they say about assuming? Yeah. Um, Heather, yeah. Do you, Heather, do you have any questions? No, I, I, I think you did Thank good. you very much. Hello, everyone. How's my audio? Good. Okay, great. Um, I am pulling up the next step slide to get specific with my language here. Um, Steve, could you speak a little bit more detail? 
to the fiscal analysis for anticipated cost and fund or you touched on that earlier. And I think I also heard about a resource we would have access to. Can you just speak a little bit more to that, please? Yeah, so the, the, a fiscal analysis is required um, for, uh, for redevelopment projects. Um, uh -huh. and, and, and there's two kinds of things, there's two things going on here. One, and we look at the law, I think even the law kind of flip flops back and forth between the plan and the evaluation of the plan from a fiscal perspective. And that has to deal mostly with infrastructure. And then there's the evaluation of specific projects. So let's say down the road that we want to do a project, a re revitalization or redevelopment project, or we have a program in place that, that can redevelop Los Portales. Well, we would also do a fiscal analysis and have something in place that would allow us that if public funds were going to be expended on a project like that, we'd have a way to be able to analyze, analyze what the benefit to the town is on a, at a fiscal level. So, um, so that's kind of how we, that's what that fiscal analysis component is, and it's component to the state law. And, uh -huh. then, and then you said the resource, um, you're talking about the Economic Development Technical Advisory Group or? <coughs> Well, I, um, that's my question. I heard something about you have access to a resource and, and I missed it. So maybe yeah. I. Yeah, so we have what's called the Economic Development Technical Advisory Panel. Uh -huh. and so they've been providing resources for us to be able to kind of, kind of an extension of what I can offer as far as economic development. And we start looking at and analyzing a lot of these things that we've been analyzing to get to this point. Um, and so they have access to demographic tools. They have access to real estate tools. But also that's just a lot of their professional guidance and expertise that allows me to be able to uh, uh, look and evaluate things as, as I'm going through my evaluation process. And then I share that evaluation, you know, with either you guys or I've shared it with council. Uh, and I'll give you an example of an evaluation and professional advice. When we were looking at the general plan site um, for, Caref or for Carefree Highway and Tom Darlington, uh, two of the EdTap members said, hey, you know what, you might want to think about the overall commercial um, on that particular site and looking at the neighborhood commercial that was originally proposed. And that may have a negative impact on the commercial neighborhood commercial that's in the Basha Center and maybe counterproductive to what we're trying to accomplish with Town Center. Um, and so we started to evaluate that as well. And, uh, and then it just happened that the neighborhood itself was like, no, we're not, we don't want any of that stuff, you know, and it doesn't make sense. We've already got it across the street. We're going to have it, you know, it's already been planned for the other corner and it just doesn't seem to make sense. And we still want a lot more vacant stuff. And so, and, and when we went through the evaluation and what we're trying to accomplish as a mission, you know, that's how we were able to shift gears there. And uh, so it's, it's just being able to get that kind of advice um, and have access to the tools. And I'll tell you, like, have, just having access to CoStar is 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 amazing for me because I you know we we as a town just can't afford it. Terrific, thank you, Stacy. I have another question, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so now with this um, this change and this sort of expanded scope of responsibility, I suppose I'll call it for P and Z. Does this change the way our structure? Will we be having more, you know, workshopping or? Or, you know, deep dives on real needs from the beginning of some of the aspects of the projects. I, I sense that it means we're going to have to change the way we function a little bit. But, but what would you say to that, Stacy and Steve? Yeah, I would think, you know, especially with the general plan update, you're already going to probably be looking at, 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 a, at a larger workload anyhow. Um, but yeah, I, I foresee with the, adding these components in, that you know and, and honestly the, the economic development advisory board stuff is going to be a very minimal the role and responsibility of the redevelopment planning process is already a planning defined function anyhow by the state law so you were already mm -hmm. that that was already going to be included so yes there's going to be a larger component that is going to you know for workshops i, I believe as well as is looking at um how we better engage the public moving forward. So, you know, seeking recommendation and by example, you know, when we had the workshop for uh, looking at the redevelopment area boundary, one of the, the to do items was making sure that we reached out to all the property owners. And that was one of the, you know, that was advice that we were provided by um, 
through the workshop session. So we did that. And, uh, and again, it's just, you know, and I would like to be, get better clarification on that as well for how the PNZ would like to be moving forward. So what was that? Uh -huh. um, I think that what I would add to that is to, to keep in mind a lot of times, you know, we do workshops, um, you know, we're looking at kind of the broader type of um, uh -huh. kind of the broader picture, the, the greater picture, like the general plan update, for example. It's not necessarily something that, you know, somebody comes in, uh, they're interested in purchasing a parcel, it's for, up for development. It's not necessarily sort of parcel or specific um, property related if, you know, already we have uh, a public process that, you know, an applicant might go through. But I think it's more in kind of these broader based kind of topics, um, general plan amendment, excuse me, uh, general plan update um, being one of those. Um, it's sort of it's sort of more of a of a broader discussion um, about kind of vision and if okay. we're heading in a certain direction as, as it pertains sort of to land use and kind of in conjunction now with economic development. Uh, uh -huh. And to kind of further just a little bit on role of, of well, how I see an, an EDAB was had when we did the we did a lease with venues for the expansion of their patio that has a component of providing public resources towards that because they utilize our parking. That's the kind of thing I typically would have taken to a, like an EDAB. That's about the only thing in the past 12 months that I would have taken to an EDAB group that had that kind of feeling and flair to that, you know, what was originally intended for. And so when we talk about stuff like that, that's the kind of stuff. So under, so if we were to, and the way I think it functionally, I would have to work is, is that if it's a planning and zoning, <coughs> course of business, it's going to be a PNZ meeting. But if we do something that's outside the course that's more aligned with the roles and responsibilities of an economic development advisory board, it'll be a calling of the economic development advisory board at this point, which is why we wanted to maintain keeping the, the EDAB alive, but having you guys act in that capacity at this point. Well, that's, that, yeah. that's how I see what we're doing here, James. A good overview of effectively our other responsibility does not change anything that we do for planning and zoning, design review, this type right. of thing. That's the technical side of it. The other side is the advisory side, given our background and knowledge in some of these areas anyhow. But everyone has to keep in mind, planning and zoning hasn't changed one oil. We still have to interpret the plans, specifications, the requests or whatnot. And then we get into the other one, then we can get off our feet off the ground a bit and wander around. But, so I think you did a superb job. The, uh, the attachment A, I went on to read that one, I've read it about twice already, is, is definitely explains that other part of our lives. And it does an excellent job of it. So that's how I looked at it. And uh, yeah, that'd be kind of interesting for the dust cells. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. If Are there any other questions of the commission or? Anything else? All right. I guess I guess a motion to adjourn. Well, yeah, there's no. And they, oh, wait a second. No, you got announcements. Yeah. No, there's no announcements, but um, I think there's a member of the public that might have a question. Oh. Well, I've got a quick comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for taking on an extra duty. You probably weren't aware of a couple months ago. Thank you. My name's John Mattis. I live in Carefree on Graythorn Circle. I don't know if you got an email I sent yesterday. I requested <coughs> Candace saying I don't have your email addresses and you don't have a town one that I'm aware of. I asked her to forward it to you. I sent it to the council and to yourself. There's some real concerns that I think historically you need to look into once you start taking on this uh, new endeavor. In December of 2020, resolution 2020-11, was approved by the council, you know, it's a strategic work plan uh, Four separate issues or developments were pointed out. Um, and there was also an economic De development advisory committee that was supposed to be appointed by the council. That never happened. Everything to date that you're hearing about this EDAP uh, group that Steve handpicked was approved, um, well, it wasn't approved. It was on the agenda of the January 2021 
council meeting. That was a month after they passed a resolution saying they're going to appoint an economic development advisory board. This was introduced. The people were introduced to the council. And after that, they said no council action necessary. Everything that has been done to date, in my opinion, has been a violation of the Arizona open meeting law because nobody's heard anything about this. There have been no meetings. I walked the downtown with Steve, he showed his ideas of what they're talking about for the redevelopment. And I go, when are they gonna appoint this, this economic development advisory? And he goes, oh, they already did. I go, when? January meeting. That's when I went back to the minutes and they weren't, a, it wasn't appointed by the council. So everything that was done, there were no minutes, there was no public review, public comment, nothing. Nothing has been public comment to date with this 2020-11 resolution that the town council approved. Uh, there's all kinds of emails that if you're interested in them, I put them in the letter. I don't, as I say, I don't know if you got the email. I put a lot of them in the email. I got it. Okay. That are rather eye-opening. May I address Mr. Mattis after he's finished speaking? Sorry? I was asking if I might address you after you're finished. Speaking. Oh, absolutely. Surely you can. But I think everything needs to, from, from the date that has been done, and there's quite a bit that has been done with no public comment, no public meetings, no anything. I think you ought to start over again. That's my, and I know that's a job, but are you gonna go by the Arizona open meeting laws? That's bottom line, what you need to, to follow the law. And that has not been followed to date. <laughs> uh, let me know when you're finished. Okay, um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with this, but I, I've been riding this rodeo since 1997. And um, the Arizona open meeting law uh, only applies if there is a quorum of the council. And in none of those emails that you cited, was there a quorum of the council? And that is a requirement for a violation of the Arizona open meeting law. And we found this out a number of years ago because the council used to do town halls once a year. And we found out that that was a violation of open meeting laws because it wasn't agendized, it was citizen driven. So I'm real familiar with the Arizona open meeting laws and it does require a quorum of the council in order to be a violation. You also cited um, Councilman Vince Delicio speaking with um, John Lassen about putting a museum on that property. Um, Steve was kind enough to introduce him to Mr. Lassen, but uh, Mr. Delicio was not doing that as a council member. He was doing that in his capacity as the president of the Cave Creek Museum at the time. And they were looking at potentially relocating the museum. And that was one location they were contemplating. He also talked with several people in Cave Creek. So that had nothing to do with his job as a council member. I mean, that, that was just talking about relocating the museum and he was the president and was talking to numerous people. So th those were two things in your letter that I, I don't think you really understood correctly. Hello. Pardon? Let's not get this. Okay. I, just a quick question. You're talking about the open meeting laws that got complex that were not followed. It's really not at the council level. It's what that initial group of people that were called themselves economic development advisory. They're the ones that didn't have, they just met whatever they want. There was no public right. hearings. Wouldn't they not talk about the council? Uh, dilating any open yeah, I think he was talking about the council also. Uh, I'm not talking about the council. I'm talking about yeah. the group that was supposed to be appointed Thanks. by the That's council, which would have been covered under the Arizona open meeting law. Correct. So, so the other thing that might be confusion, maybe in an email under those circumstances for a museum, maybe they could leave out councilman because he was addressed as a councilman, not a head of a museum. 
Right. Well, that that was an error in that case because he was doing that, that as the president of the museum, and he was talking to Mr. Lassen and to at least two yeah. other people with property in Cave Creek and when they were and contemplating and relocating the Cave Creek Museum. And it went nowhere. So that's the end. Of right. It went. It went nowhere. But I'm just saying he he was on, that had nothing to do with the town. He was no. doing that in his capacity as the president of the Cave sure. Creek Museum. I was just pointing time. that out he's because he was addressed as the councilman. Yeah. I was I was just trying to clarify that I wasn't I'm, I'm not trying to be combative I'm just trying to clarify sure well my main concern is a private resident was solicited by the town town monies obviously for staff time etc was done on helping and rezone get a zoning meeting have it voted on and also town uh, staff was used um, and read a letter from a commercial real estate person who they're talking about, gee, you know, it would be really nice if you could get a water line into the property or near to the property. And uh, that was actually addressed uh, during call to the public by Greg Crossman when that was brought up. Yeah. Uh, Chairman, uh, yeah, yeah, members of the commission, I think we're, we're digressing from what our we're getting, we're getting divided. Tonight. We had not seen a document one. So everything we're talking about here is somebody's dreams, somebody's verbiages. And we see a document with a court, then you got something wrong. Until then, just a whole bunch of talk. So thank you. You're welcome. And I just wanted you to be aware of the talk because it's more than talk when you have 20 pages of emails. That so was. I, I read your. Uh, I say, I've read your. Uh, thank you. Missive in, in detail, and you have uh, made some interesting points that are very, very valid. Very valid. Thank you. And I've heard some very interesting comments tonight also, and I appreciate it because there needs to be a dialogue. It cannot be a one way street because carefree residents ask them, not the ones that are handpicked, but ask them, do they know anything about this? They don't. They don't know about the $18 million water bill that was passed with no, I made so many comments with Greg and Gary. Uh, hey, Chairman, you got a water bill digressing topic from here. the topic. <laughs> okay, that's, that's not a question regarding the meeting tonight. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. And Chairman Cross, just so you know, I put the, just for, for yeah. the public, I put the law up there based on what he was talking about and what the ITAP was, what, what it was, <laughs> just so you can see what it was. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? No. Mr. Chairman, I do. Um, kind of related to the last thing, the, that email that was forwarded to us has an 11 megabyte attachment, and it is constipating my email server. So, <laughs> you can I go asked, ahead and I asked 11 megabytes content. 11 megabytes. Five. Now, gigabytes or megabytes? Megabytes. Megabytes is not a heck of a lot. No. no. Megabytes is nothing. Oh. Well, it is well, regardless, um, I can leave you a hard copy next time. Uh, I didn't notice that when I had sent it on. Yeah, I didn't have any problem with it. Okay. Anything else? You got some announcements, Stacey? Uh, no, Chairman, I don't have any announcements this huh? evening. No announcements this evening. Okay. <laughs> Do I have a, mic, a motion? Make a motion for chairman. Is there a second? second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? We're adjourned. We're adjourned. Okay, now that the meeting's over. <laughs>